Brain Banter is a podcast about the goings-on of Columbia University neuroscience professors and the stories behind who they are, how they got to where they are, and the motivations and explanations behind their research. My name is Lila Bear, and I'm your host. On the show today is Dr. Robert Ramez, professor of psychology at Barnard. He's also the chair of Columbia University's Seminar on Language and Cognition, and he leads the Speech and Perception Lab. Today we talk about speech and perception, but also gorillas, octopuses, space, and a lot more. Let's jump in. Okay, so I want to know when you first got into science. Well, look, you know, you realize that um, I was brought up in the American Museum of Natural History, New York City's most beloved institution. And I suppose I was interested in science as soon as the first uh, um, Sputnik was launched. The idea that there would be artificial satellites orbiting the earth that could be put there by rockets, it just seemed fantastic. And, you know, I loved, I loved astronomy at the time that I first got interested in it. People thought that the limits of the universe were the Milky Way galaxy. So I sort of grew up with the universe. Wow. It's been, yeah, it's been very exciting. Well, are you still interested in um, astronomy? Oh yeah, I have a telescope. Of course, there isn't a lot that you can see from New York City because of all the light pollution. But every now and then I go to a dark place and I look up at the sky and you know, with astronomy, the lure is non-stellar objects. Because if you look at a star through a telescope, it looks like a twinkling point of light. Really what you want is galaxies or um, uh, unusual formations. Of course, the planets retain endless interest. Very cool. Sun's planet. So, so I still, I still am an amateur astronomer and astronomy is one of the few scientific fields that amateurs actually contribute to. That's true. I have a friend actually who took a picture in her telescope and then ended up giving a lecture about it. So, no, there's lots of great stuff out there. And, um, and, uh, you know, it, it is my, it's my plan eventually to go out to Kitt Peak, where I haven't been, you know, in southern, in southern Arizona. Okay. And to, you know, they mainly do radio telescopy there. But to, to look through the eyepiece and actually see things that you can see with a spectacular telescope when the sky is dark at night and there's no humidity. Being an astronomer in New York is really like, it's the, it's the worst of all, of, of all things combined. At least we occasionally have clear nights. Very occasionally. But, so, you know, when I was growing up, I might have seen the Milky Way maybe once or twice. And this would have been on family trips to places where the sky was dark. And I remember once being out at the beach during a failure of the Northeast power grid Meaning? Well, so so the lights, there was no electricity. Okay. Right. And there were no lights. And you could basically see the Milky Way plunge right into the sea. It was spectacular. Wow. That sounds amazing. That was great. So now now that I've got my telescope, I see the Milky Way all the time. Because if you go far enough away from the lights of big city, and that's really only a couple of hours, about 100 miles straight up Broadway, the sky is dark enough to see the Milky Way at least a couple of times um, uh, you know, in a two week span. So yeah, the sky is great. Of course, now, um, my, my real scientific work has nothing to do with space. And in fact, the phenomena that I study are so local. So let's talk before we even dive into that. Okay. How you started off, you're interested in astronomy and yeah. you grew up in the New York city museum system. Yeah. You, it sounds like you were interested in science did you know going into university what you were going to study? And did you kind of see your path ahead of you? Well, as a kid, I had worked as a lab hand. I was a teenage laboratory assistant at um, a hospital on 17th Street, which is now part of, uh, I guess it's part of Mount Sinai. But I worked in a genetics lab and I also worked in um, a histology lab 
making, trying to use stains to visualize anatomical structures in tissue samples. And, you know, I guess I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure really on the, I wasn't sure about science, frankly. Mm -hmm. And that's because I also was, um, uh, I was a musician and, you know, the music world in New York is the great, it's the, one of the best things about the city. And it's also one of the best places in the world to be a musician. And I was really involved with that. And I, I'm not sure I, I, I knew what I wanted and maybe I hoped I wouldn't have to choose. I could still continue to play bar gigs with my, uh, with my band and maybe work on uh, problems in genetics. Are you still in the band or? No, but you know, I started, I, we, I bought a new piano about, uh, about 10 years ago and there were, you know, when you get a new instrument, it makes you a little bit more eager to try things that you'd been reluctant to try. And I was at the end of my knowledge. So um, I live with somebody much wiser than me who said, why don't you get a teacher? Your teacher will that. help you. And I thought, yes, teach. I, I believe that teachers are beneficial. <laughs> and I had offered a graduate seminar um, that was uh, cross-listed in psychology and in music with a composer whose office was in Dodge. And one of the people who is in the class was actually a piano student from Juilliard who is studying at Columbia on the link program. Did you know there's a link? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the people who, who, who come to take classes here are those who are bored with practicing all day long. They would like occasionally to get a new idea. And he turned out to have lots of ideas. And I asked him if he'd be my teacher. And he said, sure. And I started taking lessons again. And then when he left New York to take a job in um, California, he handed me off to a, an old friend of his who's a conductor, who is a magnificent historian of music and a great piano player. And I'm still taking lessons like a schoolboy. So you're right, I didn't have to choose. I'm, all, I'm actually making progress. I bet. I mean, with a teacher, you can really learn. Well, they actually, they asked Pablo Casals, the great ch Spanish cellist, when he was quite elderly, um, what his routine was like. And he said, well, I practice every day. And they said to him, Casals, you are, you've been the greatest cellist in the world for 50 years. Why are you still practicing? And he said, well, I'm actually getting better. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can ever stop practicing. Right. You're exactly right. You need to practice skill to establish it and you need to practice to maintain it. And that's one of the things that we know from neuroscience investigations. Right. So speaking of neuroscience, yeah. um, do you apply that? Do you feel like you're still learning every day and practicing every day in regards to being a teacher and what you teach and what you learn? So we, we teach a lot about, um, about the, I, one, of my, one of my courses is a survey of the senses, which is, it's the introduction to um, sensory physiology and the psychology of the senses. That is what's, what is possible to notice and how your ability to notice those things that you look at or listen to or feel um, we also do taste, smell, and balance too. How that affects your ability to identify the properties of objects and events. And um, one of the things that changes with practice is how the piano feels to you. Mm. And we know the neuroscience of this from studies of hamster whiskers. That was the way. That was the way the neuroscience first got it. First, first was done. So, so what do the hamster whiskers tell us? Well, it turns out that receptive fields in the somatosensory system are dynamic. You might think of them as taking their shape as a consequence of gene expression, but it turns out that of all of the sensory lamina, whether it's in the retina or in the cochlea or on the surface of the tongue or in the olfactory epithelium, the sensory lamina that changes the most 
morphologically over the life cycle is the skin. The body proportions change. Right. And of course, use of the skin. You have these touch phobias. Oh, I should also include this, the tip of the tongue. But you have these touch phobias and you use them to do, to do different things over the course of, of your life cycle. And they dynamically rewire the mm. cortical receptive fields. And this was shown in hamster whiskers with, um, uh, if you amputate a hamster's whisker, then the cells that had formerly been the cortical cells that were driven by um, uh, touch receptors in that portion of the hamster's lip are repurposed for the adjacent whiskers. Hmm. Okay. And when people talk about plasticity, and of course, your grandparents from reading the newspaper know about neural plasticity, I'm guessing. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. Yeah, they know about plasticity. What they mean by plasticity, ah, things change. That's what they mean, right? What plasticity really is, is it changes in the excitability of uh, cortical receptive fields from changes simply in use. And those studies were actually done with monkeys in which they produced surgical, surgically imposed syndactyly. That is, they joined fingers together. And what they found was that the receptive fields that used to be associated with middle finger or with ring finger then became evocable or elicited by touch to either finger. Hmm. So, so, okay, so they, so they attached fingers. They attached two fingers. Now, let me see if I can do it. Uh, okay. let's, we only need to do it in one hand. So they okay. attached two fingers and then previously. Wait, so for the listeners, just so you know, we're oh, yeah, visualizing we're, the pinky, the three on the, the three from your pinky. The are three finger and third and middle finger are touching, are now touching. Okay. Okay. All right. So initially the, the receptive fields that respond to middle finger don't respond to ring finger. And those that respond to ring finger don't respond to middle finger. Right. But if you make it impossible to decouple these mechanically, okay. then you find sensory merger. Cool. Even though the receptors still exist. Okay. Right. So it's the, it's the study that clearly showed that it wasn't a matter of amputation or the death of receptors, but it was actually functional. And that's what's happening when you practice and the feeling of the piano changes as a consequence of something that Haydn asks you to do with your fingers or Mozart asks you to do with your fingers. It simply feels different as a consequence of practice. And of course, if you stop practicing it, it's going to go away. Hmm. It takes months for this to happen, whether it's, you know, the excitability of somatosensory fields in the hand area of the monkey or piano playing. That's one of the reasons why you have to keep practicing to maintain it. So can you tell me, a little bit about the research that you're doing right now. Uh, okay. So the work that we study, the, the phenomena that we study, the phenomena of spoken language. Okay. And um, not, to, not to put it too casually, but what happens in spoken language is that you have something urgent and important that you wish to convey. All the time. So... This intention cannot be communicated telepathically. You've got to actually do something. So let's, let's, let's talk about the vocal and auditory connection. You could actually write it out and pass somebody the note. But in, in order to, to communicate something vocally, you have to execute a series of coordinated actions by taking the anatomy of chewing, swallowing, and breathing, and applying them for sound production. And yet, the sounds that you make are not in the least mimetic. You're not trying to make, trying to make a sound like the thing you're trying to say. You're actually trying to make sounds that articulate words in your language. And by virtue of recognizing the sounds or something about them, 
it's possible to tell what words somebody said. And by knowing the words they said, you can tell what they sort of meant. And of course, if you want to get a clearer idea of it, you reply with a question. And then the exchange of meaning becomes refined in conversation. And this aspect of human communication is really unique to us. There are no other species that converse. What we're doing right now, it's a, it's a social practice, of course, but it's our ability to follow the thread of the plot when we speak to each other. That's, that's us. That's a cognitive use that only occurs in us. On that note, I want this to be a quick tangent, but have you ever studied bees in their language? Well, you know, um, Tinberg and Lawrence and von Frisch got the Nobel Prize for this work on ethology, even though it's not clear what it had to do with physiology and medicine. But every, psych, every psychology department always offers animal behavior as a as a course for that for elective credit. And maybe this is too much information, but I did my senior thesis on fireflies and on spiders. Wow. Okay. Not because it was communicative, but because in in many regards, what they do is syntactically organized. That is, it has a structure to the sequence that is typical of, in this case, of the species that's actually producing. In the case of fireflies, it's the flash pattern. Now, spiders weren't communicative, but there was lots of research on the way in which spiders weave their orb webs. And orb weavers were really an important, um, there's a, a pattern to the production of orb webs that is every bit as much syntactic as what we're saying right now. Right. So other animals do have to communicate. Um, so what makes our communication method the most established, like other than the obvious that we're the most dominant? Species? Right, right, right. It's not just that we are, we have the numbers. So, it, you know, the way in which this is a philosophical question, is it not? Right. It is. I think so. So the way some philosophers discuss this is by comparing the gorilla and the octopus. Two very smart animals. Very smart and really different. So we know from 150 years, now maybe 100 years of investigations of gorillas including the famous studies by Wolfgang Kohler on Tenerife that were published under the title The Mentality of Apes, which you've probably seen um, apes piling up boxes and screwing jointed sticks together in order to knock some bananas off a, a hook attached to the ceiling. Apes are really clever and they have a lot going on cognitively, but communicatively, it's just not developed in them. So they have a kind of um, mental life that is quite similar to us. And yet they don't have the biology and they certainly don't have the social practice of exchanging uh, their ideas about things out of sight, which is what we're doing right now. For those of you out in the podcast world, there is neither an octopus nor a gorilla present in our discussion, right? So we're now talking about things that are out of sight. That's what language does. It lets you share, share ideas about things that are not present. Now, the octopus is exactly the complement of the gorilla. It has a communication system that's better than the Reuters scroll in Times Square. You know what I'm referring to? No. There's a, there's a, uh, so the Reuters building in Times Square has a, a ribbon of light bulbs on which they, um, they uh, project a constant text stream mm-hmm. of information from its news services. Right. So, 
an octop an octopus has something like that. Uh, they're um, they're chromatophores, and they can um, uh, present a static pattern or a rolling pattern. They can change color. I mean, it's amazing what they're capable of doing. But none of it is communicative. And octopi are solitary creatures, mm -hmm. so they're doing this with nobody around. So it's clearly not communicative behavior, and yet. Um, uh, they have the, if only you could have hybridize an octopus to a gorilla, you'd have a display device like an octopus that could be hooked up to the mental life of a gorilla. And it would be, it would be magic. Right. You would, you'd spend all, all day in exchange of ideas with this gorilla, perhaps. Or gorilla octopus, or gorilla, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But, but so so they're they're they're, and you know we've yet to find something that's halfway in between that has let's say maybe not as quite an active imagination as a gorilla, but a better communication system than gorillas have, or something that's like an octopus, but because it's sociable, it's involved in um, exchange of ideas, but mm. nothing's, you know, I, I mean, I still have hope that there'll be some animal species. You know, one of the things that's loneliest about the neuroscience of language, there's no animal model. Right. Huh. So we're sort of stuck. Studying ourselves. Studying ourselves. You yeah. You can only do so much when you can't be completely objective. I mean, you're right. You're right. You're right. exactly right. So, okay. Just to run it back to your lab. Yeah. Um, what is, how do you study language? Like with what method and what is your goal right now? What are you, what are you looking for? Well, look, we, we actually took the tiger by the tail with a study that shocked everybody. And as a result of that, we're, we're still chasing down leads of this sort of fundamental breakthrough. So um, what we study is, first of all, how you can tell that speech is present in the th sounds that you hear. Okay. And so how your brain recognizes that there is sound? Just, well, what's interesting about the auditory system is it's on all the time. Right. That is, if you, if you look at uh, peripheral uh, auditory responses to sound of somebody who's asleep, it looks like they're awake. Yeah. So, so it's pretty clear that what, what one of the things that plays a major role in perception by listening, oh, when listening is different than hearing. Scientifically, how would you differentiate? So it, it, it's the slumbering giant in everybody's account of perception, which is attention. So you must know about the cases, the famous cases in vision that show that if you haven't paid attention to it, it's as if it didn't happen. This is described by our colleagues, uh, Rock and Mac, as inattentional blindness. If you don't pay attention to it, it, you're simply blind to it. And of course, it's on the basis of these studies that um, the law now says you're not allowed to operate a motor vehicle while you're texting. And that's because no matter how much you think that you've got the oncoming traffic in your field of view, if you're paying attention to your phone, you see nothing of what's out there through your windshield. And in fact, there's some, I saw a, a, an announcement of a new product recently, which is a, a, a display device that's transparent, that becomes your windshield. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this is going to be um, obsolete by 2060 when we finally have self-driving cars. That's the estimate. Maybe sooner. No, as the oh. estimate, we simply don't know enough to okay. be able to have it have it much before 2060. But if you're actually viewing the road through a screen that has, I, I don't know. I, I, I initially I thought about it as map reading, but it's probably not that. You're probably watching um, Mario Mario Brothers and controlling controlling the display through your windshield so that you can be entertained on your because nothing's more boring than a drive in the country. But if you're paying attention to what's on your screen, you're not seeing what's out on the road. 
So we can do one thing at a time or can, can we do more than one thing at a time? Do you, you think? You can switch very rapidly. And of course, one of the amazing things about attention is even if you're trying to pay attention to one thing, your attention wanders. Right. Right. So you're always changing attention. Right now, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, oh, this is also for people in the, in the, uh, in the podcast world. I'm actually looking at Lila's, Lila's face on the screen. But every now and then, I'm actually, my attention is drifting to something on the painting that's behind your head, which is really nice abstract. Is that something you made? No, yeah, I didn't make it. Oh, we'll take credit for it anyway. Oh, yeah, I made it. Uh, <laughs> or or um, I'm checking to see how much time we have left because I've got my, my clock on the screen. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm just doing it. But I, it, is, it is something that I'm doing deliberately. It is my, my attention. And the same thing happens in the auditory realm, but even more. So we had taken the sounds of speech and disguised them by simplifying the spectrum enormously. And what it sounded like was the sound of whistles. I've got an example that I can actually share with you. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Got it? Got it. Um, up at the top, that's figure one. Okay, this guy? That's a spectral representation of a sentence that I uttered. And uh, time is rolling on the x-axis. Okay. Frequency is rolling on the y-axis. Of course, the range of hearing goes up to 20 kilohertz. So this is just showing the lowest five kilohertz. Okay. And the dark bars show where the concentration of energy is as I spoke. And you can see they're rising and falling and they've got sort of striped patterns and, and patches of, um, of regular and irregular energy. And if you play that sound, that is an example of natural speech, you'll hear me say that sentence and it'll have the, voc the, the quality auditorily of uh, someone's natural speech. Jazz and swing fans like fast music. Okay, so now, Look at the spectrum shown directly below it. Okay. It doesn't have any of the rich structure that you see in, uh, in the natural speech. It lacks broadband resonances. It doesn't have um, a periodic uh, structure associated with the buzzing of your larynx. And it doesn't have the alternation of harmonic and, and, um, and uh, aperiodic excitation associated with um, various portions of this, like um, the S in swing or the S in fast, right. right? Or even the Z in music, right? And so what we did is we disguised this speech pattern by converting it into um, time-varying sinusoids. And that's what this spectrum shows. The main way to, to understand what we did is we took speech and we threw away all of the natural products of vocalization and left behind in very reduced structure only the basic pattern of resonance changes. Got it. Okay. But we disguised these by making uh, a, a sinusoid is actually produced by a linear emitter, not by a resonator. So if the auditory system um, which has been shaped by biological evolution over millions of years, um, is uh, keyed to recognizing the physical causes of sounds, it should actually put this kind of sound, that speech, in a wholly different category than the sound that's made by linear emission. Um, and in fact, that's what our, that's what our listeners did when we played um, sounds like this for them and asked them what they heard. They said they heard weird contrapuntal music or they heard radio interference. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of subjects who were critical of the experimenters who said, you haven't set the experiment up properly. I don't hear anything coherent. Okay, okay. so should we so listen play, to the Play the second sample. Okay, let's do it. I'll give it another play because it had there was a little artifact in it. Okay. Play it again. Jazz and 
jazz and swing bands like best music. Whoa. So, so yes, whoa, exactly. So it doesn't sound like a natural voice. And several of the studies that we've done following, following this show that you can actually track the frequency changes of the individual tones, which you can't do with the individual uh, resonances that are components of natural speech. So it has a very different kind of perceptual organization. And when listeners first heard it without being asked to transcribe speech, but instead were simply asked to tell us what they heard. <clears throat> they had no idea what they were listening to. They heard this as independent uh, sound sources, which of course is what they were. Right. Okay. But when we said to them, we're trying out a new speech synthesizer, tell us what the words were. Then they got most of the words right. With the second sound that we just played? Yeah. So can we, let's listen to it again, just yeah. to try it out. Okay. Jazz and swing bands like best music. Oh, okay. Yeah, when you pay attention and when you've heard the first version, I think that. So okay. that, well, so we didn't actually play the first version. We brought subjects in cold. Okay. Without giving them any preliminaries. And that was because we didn't want to, we didn't want to risk corrupting their attention to this by um, giving them something in mind to hear. And that's because, you know, like e each of us is a folk psychologist as well as a, a scientific psychologist. And one of the things that folk psychology tells, and of course, everyone's grandmother knows this, this is a kind of bubby psychology. W they know that um, you're, uh, attitudes, including your irrational attitudes, are projected outward onto the world that you see, and that perception is no more than a screen upon which your prejudices get a chance to be more vivid. And, and that's the folk psychology. But what we actually, and of course, we found that that folk psychology is wrong, which of course it all often is. Um, when we actually told listeners what to listen for and gave them moth-eaten versions of this pattern where the entire pattern wasn't available at the same time, they very cheerfully said, no, I didn't hear it then. Hmm. So it's not as if there's a kind of illusion that's going on in which they think they're actually hearing it. What attention is doing is what attention always does. It focuses the inspection of the perceiver on an aspect of the sensory samples that lets the assay be accurate. So what they were able to do was to pay attention in a clear enough way that let them run a full analysis. And, you know, they, again, they mostly got it. Asking somebody to remember a sentence that's three seconds long might add a bit of cognitive load and make it hard for them to remember all, all, all of it. But even so, they mainly get it. Even if you just tell them it's synthetic speech, see if you can see, see if you can tell what you, what you heard. Right. And um, if you tell them what to expect, and you violate that expectation, they tell you they didn't hear it. And that's because, again, attention is sharpening the acuity of their perceptual asset. They're using attention to direct perceptual analysis, which of course is what attention must do, whether you're texting, operating a motor vehicle, or listening to speech. Now, the question is, how could they possibly have done it? Because none of the typical ingredients of uh, vocal sound production were present. And the answer, which turned out to be a kind of um, shock to the system, is that they're doing it by sensitivity to modulation, independent to the properties of the carrier that's being modulated. And of course, we knew that none of this, or we, we believed that nothing of the sensory bitmap survives intact to get to the cortex, right? There is a reduction in the 
in the number of um, receptors to, pa to, to, to pathways that shows that um, sensory inflow is collected and, um, and formed into patterns uh, before it gets very much, before it moves very far along the neural axis toward uh, the central, uh, to, to centers of, of, of analysis. So we knew that the sensory bitmap couldn't really be required, but this was the first real proof that in the absence of all of the exquisite details that make speech sound like speech, you can basically track the changes over time and get the, get the, the syllables, the consonants and vowels, and, and cash those in for words. So that was our finding. And what mm -hmm. we've been working on still is to find out how this, how this process actually occurs, what, what determines the allocation of attention, what, it, what attention is likely to lock onto, what's the temporal integration window of attention, what differs between the case in which you pay attention with the sensory qualities of speech and without the sensory qualities of speech. This has turned out to be a very rich vein to mine. And of course, one of the things that we've also studied is how, how it happens that speech without any of these natural qualities sounds like a specific individual. And this is actually one of, the, one of the things that happened in my lab that I'm proudest of. We were doing a study one day and one of the students who was actually running the study said to me, you know, the sine wave vocal patterns sound like you. And I said, there's no way that that could be true. These are the most abstracted, impoverished signals anybody ever worked with in speech synthesis. There's no chance it, re it, it, can, it preserves any of my natural vocal quality. And they said, no, it's not the natural vocal quality. It's the way you make your vowels and the way you make your consonants. And I said, well, this sounds to me like a dollar bet. So let's do a study to see whether anybody can tell the difference between this type of speech synthesis based on my samples and speech synthesis based on anybody else's samples. And of course, Lila, you and I differ in our vocal scale. And that's because uh, the secondary sexual dimorphism gives males a longer vocal tract than females. And of course, children are smaller than both of us. So one of the things that happens in development is that children wind up um, growing into their adult vocal resonances. But when they're, when they're children, there's no chance that they ever could replicate the adult sounds that they hear in the nursery. Their heads are just too small. So... We've, we've done some child synthesis, by the way, but this was a project in which we, we did synthesis of adult males and adult females. And we thought, as long as we want to see whether they can tell a difference between two, we may as well see if they can tell a difference among 10. Okay. Right. And what we found is that whether you are familiar with these individuals from ordinary daily life, with their natural speech, or whether you become familiarized with somebody by hearing their speech samples in a laboratory, under laboratory conditions, you don't really have much trouble being able to identify them mm -hmm. from sine wave versions of their speech. And that's because one of the things that gets conveyed is properties of their dialect and of their idiolect. So dialect is the thing that um, uh, f distinguishes social groups uh, and 
often it's done by a geographical tag. So my, my dialect group is probably building 10 in Stuyvesant, uh, sorry, Playground 10 in Stuyvesant Town. That was where I played when I was eight. And that's where I played with a, a, a group of, of people who were, let's say, ranged in age from six to 10. And we all had a dialect of English that was specific to our playground that differed from the parental dialect. Both my parents are from Brooklyn. I don't speak Brooklyn English. I speak Playground 10 English. And, <laughs> and that comes across in my speech. So for example, this morning, I had coffee. I did not have coffee. I had coffee. You had coffee. Where are you from? I'm from Tennessee, actually. Yeah. And are you from uh, Nashville? I'm from Memphis. Memphis. But I actually don't have... Memphis is a river town, but you don't sound like Memphis. I know. I don't, I don't sound like Memphis. It's interesting. I don't, people ask me, I don't know where. Where were I, you eight? Where was I eight? Eight-year-old. I was a, I was also definitely on a playground at like a local little Jewish community center. Can you, can you do a Memphis accent? I, I, I can try. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't. So that's, that's one of the things that sine waves preserve because it, that's a way in which the grammatically governed structures produce particular tongue shapes and tongue movements huh. that get conveyed readily in the sound that sine wave patterns imitate. So wait, just to take a step back, yeah. your parents, you don't speak Brooklyn, New York, and I don't speak Memphis. My, my parents have a Southern accent and your parents, I assume, speak, have, a Brooklyn accent. have a Brooklyn accent. So why didn't we pick that up? Why did we choose because that? And this is something, you know, when I would explain this to my parents, they would hate it. <laughs> okay. They hate this explanation. So I'll tell you this, but you have to promise me you'll talk to your parents about it. I will. I will. It turns out that the influence of the nursery in language development is well overemphasized. It's not the nursery. It's the playground. Why and of course, you knew about this because we happen to live in a country that has a very rich immigrant history. And the children of immigrants wind up speaking the local dialect, not the heavily accented version that their parents speak, if their parents even speak English. What you learn in the playground has much greater resonance than what you learn in the nursery. And that's because in the nursery, for example, you're bootstrapping. It just so happens that you spend your time in the playground at an epoch in development when you're becoming your social self. And of course, language is a way in which your spoken language is the way in which you identify yourself to your cohort. And this is a social practice, of course, but what, what, what is most important about this is that you need to resemble your group with sufficient accuracy that you are taken as a member of it, but you need to be unique within the group so everybody will know it's you. And those two dispositions are opposing. Do you see that? Yeah, so you have to yeah. do a mixture. So. You have to find a way. And of course, the my favorite proof of this was, if, was a, uh, with the world's weirdest twin study done in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. By Keith Johnson, who's now in the faculty at University of California, but he used to be, um, he used to be at Columbus. And in the Buckeye Corpus, which is a collection of utterances of people from Columbus, Ohio, he's got a portion of this that had child speech. And because Columbus, like every other town, has a certain number of MZ twins, monozygotic twins, they were identical twins in the speech samples. So, but these identical twins were reared together. So you want to know of what earthly significance could a twin study be when twins are reared together? And the answer is they're morphologically so similar that some of their speech comparing twin one to twin two, I guess, or the 
good twin to the evil twin. Comparing one twin to the other, some of their speech is so similar. It's as if there were a single individual recorded on two separate instances, okay? And that's what you would expect if the properties of speech are the consequence of the anatomical structures that resonate in order to produce speech sound. Right, but... But, right, good. <laughs> but some of the things that they said were so different. It was as if a differentiation mechanism were applying or a differentiation um, uh, disposition were applying in which it was important for some things to distinguish the twins one from the other. Okay, so it's kind of like survival and we're survival. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of identity marking. Okay. Now, when you think of identity marking, you probably think of dogs. Right. Okay, I, I can I can see right? that. Got it. Got it. But what we do is we do it with sound. That and that's sense. because we all wear the same clothes. We all wear the same eyeglasses. We all go to the same barbers. We all watch the same movies. We go to the same schools. We play in the same playgrounds, right? But when we speak, that's the way you know it's us. Wow. You know who we are. Very cool. So it's signing your name. Yeah. So, so, um, so we actually found that um, it's that the basis for this, and that the basis, sorry, we found that it was preserved even in modulation sensitivity. Right. And what we found is that what listeners seem to be um, learning when they encounter a new talker is something about the sound space that they're using to create their speech, but also the linguistically governed properties that regulate syllable production. You could almost say that people, each of us has a unique style and that style has to do with whether you're a fast talker or a slow talker, whether you um, articulate clearly as I am when I use my professor voice or whether I articulate casually and we all alternate between clear and casual. Um, and the particular um, uh, dimensions that are at play linguistically when um, we um, speak excitedly or with a blasé attitude or when we speak as if we wish to be understood or we speak as if we wish to be obeyed or we speak as if we wish to be um, uh, engaging. So all of those things live in exactly the same articulatory space right. that words do. And you can't help but identify yourself simply by trying to say what was on your mind to say, like jazz and swing fans, like fast music right it always and only sounds like you or often sounds only like you so even when you strip everything away back to the synthesized version you can still it still is you still it still is. is you and in one of our studies which is one of the only things you can do in synthesis we actually took sex out that okay. is people can generally tell whether a, a synthesized voice was produced by a male or a female or a child. And that's because there are scale differences. So we were able to use a warping function that gave everybody exactly the same head size, whether the original speech was produced by a male or female. Or, uh, and what we found is that under those circumstances, you can no longer tell whether you're listening to a man or a woman, but you always know who it was. Wow. Got it? No, so what that means, Lila, is that there are some characteristics of you that are always and only you, regardless of a disguise or a disguise that you might adopt. So crazy question, but yeah. you know how when sometimes there are like crazy scenario someone might, might be kidnapped and they send you a voice memo telling you something very encrypted do you think that we could one day identify that person no matter what so you know there are there are lots of forensic applications in um my branch of uh, of research and one of the things is that some kinds of vocal disguise are really terrific 
Okay. They are, they are very successful in concealing identity. And you can guess what they might be now that you know that modulation sensitivity is so important. What should you distort in order to, dis to make a voice unrecognizable? You need to distort the way you articulate vowels. And? And you need to distort just the modularity. But it's the modulation. Modulation. Right. You need to distort the modulation. So temporal characteristics under distortion turn out to be very effective ways of disguising. I hope no criminals are listening to this. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I'll try to block them all. Yeah, yeah. But so, but, but, and other kinds of disguise, like the kind that we used, absolutely ineffective. Right. It's funny, really isn't cool. it? I, it's yeah. crazy. I need to read more about this. I'm really... There's so much more I, I don't even know. Well, look, that I would say that goes double for me. But um, so, so the, the two projects that really keep us busy um, in my lab are how can you tell that speech was produced if it doesn't depend on a particular kind of sound? Right. But instead depends on the way in which the sound that you've got is changing and um, what role attention plays in that. And then how can you... What is it about becoming familiar with somebody's voice that lets you recognize them even under conditions of novelty where you don't know what they're likely to say? And um, it also gives you an intelligibility gain to listen to somebody familiar. Did you know? So even though using my professor voice makes me pretty intelligible in a classroom, once people get to know me, they no longer uh, are, are, are so uncertain to be uh, uncertain about exactly what I said. They actually recognize their perceptual assays of my speech become more accurate. Wow. So why that should be is really a very intriguing problem. That is very so, intriguing. So that's so that's where we are. Okay. And um, I have a merry band of of student researchers. Uh, who, who do this work. We, our project is, is supported by the National Science Foundation. And, um, and I, I just hope I'll, I'll wind up solving another piece of this problem before I hang up my spurs. Nobody ever solves their entire problem, you know. Well, you'll pass it on. You'll pass on the torch. That's right. Exactly right. Luckily, I have lots of, lots of good colleagues, including younger colleagues, who actually um, are uh, uh, at work uh, on this project. So, Right. Well, I feel like your work is also so cool because it mixes in philosophy and just other... You have to really think about why um, things happen. Well, but, yeah. you're exactly right. And that's part of the appeal. It, it definitely is. At least to me. I mean, we have the model railroading aspect in which we have lots of equipment to work with and lots of stuff that has to be calculated and um, things that um, uh, have to uh, work just right in order for us to get our work done. Right. But then we also have the, uh, the philosophical part. Right. Or when, the, uh, for when we're busy with a, uh, with a wire wrapper, we can think a great thought. Yeah. Well, I know that the time is wrapping up and I appreciate you being so generous with me. You're very welcome. And I learned so much um, and I'm so serious. I, I'm, I want to learn more. I'm maybe I'll stop by your office hours. I'm not taking your class. But... Well, you should. Okay. Okay. Come and say hello and I'll say okay. goodbye. Okay. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening to this episode of Brain Banter. Make sure to follow us on social media. Our Instagram is at graymatterscu. If you want to request a neuroscience professor for me to interview, you can do so at our website, which is graymattersjournalcu.org. This episode was produced and edited by me, Lila Bear. Research was done by Melody Fang and Anna Sofia Rico Rosso. Graphic design was also done by Melody Fang. Our production staff includes Sam Hutchinson and Mariana Mosin. You've been listening to Brain Banter by Gray Matters, Columbia University. See you guys next week.